Hi there. This is Stephen L, a Senior Director in the Energy and Climate Scenarios Capability here at IHS Market, and welcome to this Tier Week conversation presented by IHS Market. In this series, we've been exploring a range of pertinent issues relating to the energy transition and the coronavirus pandemic recession with leaders from across the energy spectrum. We have a hot topic to explore today. We'll be looking at the question of how we get to net zero with CO2 removal technologies. I'm very pleased to welcome a panel of experts in the field of CO2 removal uh, to today's discussion. Uh, let me welcome Barbara Berger, uh, president of Chevron Technology Ventures, the United States Department of Energy Assistant Secretary for Fossil Energy, Steve Winberg, and Julio Friedman, a senior research scholar at the Center um, global Energy Policy at Columbia University. Barbara, Steve, Julio, welcome to today's conversation. Julio, if I could uh, ask you to set the scene for our audience by explaining what it is we're talking about when we talk about net zero uh, and what are CO2 removal technologies. I'm happy to, and thank you for having me here, uh, especially with such an outstanding panel. Uh, Net zero is actually a pretty straightforward concept. The arithmetic is about as easy as you can get. There's just a couple of most central things to understand about it. First and foremost, if you don't achieve net zero, you never stabilize climate. Just doesn't happen. Otherwise, you keep adding CO2 to the atmosphere and climate keeps changing. So first order of business is you got to get to zero. One of the things that means then is any carbon that you pull from the earth must go back to the earth. Any carbon emissions that are emitted anywhere must be balanced by unemissions, which is a CO2 removal. I'll get to that in a sec. That's the core of it. And what most people don't quite understand is how hard that is to achieve and how limited the option set is. Uh, it's part of the reason we need an aggressive innovation agenda to get more things on the field, like what Barbara and uh, uh, Secretary Winberg's uh, groups are working on. Uh, but uh, it also means that we're going to need some set of policies to create market opportunities for people to do stuff in this space to get to net zero. Uh, the volumes we're talking about are huge, uh, and it ain't easy to do. In order to get to net zero, again, any emissions anywhere have to be balanced by removal. And some emissions we really don't have any solutions for. We just don't have them. Uh, airlines and air flight is one classic example. Another one, and much larger, is just putting fertilizer on land for farms. Like, we're going to keep feeding people, we're going to keep growing food, we're going to keep doing that. That's a large fraction of global emissions, and we don't have a pathway for it. So we have to pull on the order of 5 to 10 billion tons of CO2 out of the air and oceans every year, somewhere around 2050. We have to be moving that volume. That's a volume equal to the size of the oil and gas industry working in reverse. So what can you do? There's basically uh, five or six pillars that people can go after, technology pathways. And you can think about them easily as two groups. There's nature-based solutions or managed ecosystems. These are things like forests, soils. There's a bunch of different ways you can go into that. Then there's these technology-enabled pathways, things like bioenergy with CCS, which I know the Department of Energy is working on. Uh, Direct air capture, which Steve's program has uh, already launched. Uh, carbon mineralization, which is coming into view as an option to do. Uh, and, and that's kind of it. There's not that many options out there. And according to recent studies, for example, uh, the Energy Futures Initiative work of the National Academies, all of the solutions we have today for CO2 removal can create on the order of a gigaton for the U.S., and that's just not enough. It's, we, we are off still by factors of two to five, and we simply need to innovate more and do more than we've got. Thank you very much, Julio. So we've developed more and more of an aggressive climate policy uh, 
action narrative of late. We've seen net zero targets coming from uh, the largest national emitter, China, um, on a, a longer term time scale, and many in the oil and gas sector thinking about uh, even portfolio level um, uh, balance between sources and things. And if I was to summarize, it's really about achieving that sort of balance between that which we produce and that which we uh, absorb. In terms of the technologies, it does look like there's quite a broad suite of options uh, available, naturally occurring, but then uh, opportunities for specific technologies to contribute towards the achievement of that balance. And as you say, that's part of what uh, Steve and the Department of Energy in the United States have been actively encouraging. Steve, we've seen a real upsurge in CO2 removal project activity in the United States over the course of the last 12 months. Uh, in particular, really big focus on hydrogen as part of that story. I was wondering if you could share with the audience how the DOE has been approaching the topic. Sure, and um, it's also good to be with everyone today. As Julio mentioned, we've, we've got a whole suite of technologies. Um, and one of the things that uh, was pretty clear when I arrived here three years ago is that we still had a big focus on uh, CCUS related for the coal industry, for coal power generation. And it was clear that we needed to expand beyond that, looking at natural gas power generation, looking at industrial sources, and also the, as Leo mentioned, the direct air capture. Uh, and so those technologies um, are advancing pretty well. Uh, they will be helped by the 45Q. Uh, the IRS has been working on this now for two years and uh, nine months, uh, hopefully, We'll see the final regulation coming out by the end of this year. And I, I do believe that there is capital sitting, well, I know there's capital sitting on the sidelines waiting for that 45Q uh, regulation to be finalized. And then we will see some commercial projects take, um, take root. Um, and what I've been saying consistently, and I continue to believe this, is once industry picks up this technology and runs with it, uh, that's when the learning really begins and the federal government can uh, can start to back away and, and look at other things and take taxpayer dollars and move in other directions. And so I look forward to that day. So Stephen, you mentioned hydrogen, and uh, that is a necessary part of whatever energy transition uh, we go through here in the U.S. or other countries go through, uh, because here in the United States, uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, transportation emissions are now bigger uh, or higher percentage uh, than power generation emissions. And so what do we do about that? Uh, we're not all going to be driving uh, electric vehicles. Uh, that's a little bit difficult to do on a ship or a train or uh, even a plane or uh, large uh, over-the-road trucks and construction vehicles and so forth. So hydrogen can play a role there. So there's a lot of discussion, a lot of talk about green hydrogen made from, uh, from renewable energy, intermittent renewable energy, but the cost of that is quite high. So I don't think we need to be constrained right now in where we might take a hydrogen economy. And so we're focused on um, fossil energy, uh, whether it's coal and biomass and waste plastics, uh, gasifying those three and producing hydrogen with CCUS or natural gas um, with uh, steam methane reforming with CCUS, uh, we can be at uh, near zero uh, or even zero CO2 emissions. And if we use coal, biomass, and the waste plastics, then we're actually at net negative CO2 emissions to produce that hydrogen. So we're going to continue focusing on that, and we will see if a hydrogen economy emerges. Um, We've been down this road uh, about every couple of decades. Uh, we'll see. It might take off this time. Um, but uh, I view it as the federal government's job to look out over the horizon and think about where the country, where the world might want to go and make sure that we have the technologies available uh, for commercial enterprise to adopt them and implement. Thank you, Steve. Um, it does appear as though DOE is really developing a broad suite of opportunities, irrespective of what the uh, overall political um, uh, orientation uh, and climate change action happens to be uh, at the federal level in the United States. And, and as you rightly say, Steve, companies have been 
you know, following the signal sent by DOE, grabbing the opportunity and running with it. And Chevron is very much at the forefront of that movement. Uh, Barbara, uh, it'd be great to hear uh, from you about what uh, Chevron Technology Ventures has been doing to advance the cause of CO2 removal. Sure, and it's great to be here and great to be on a panel with Steve and Julio. I actually wanted to start with Chevron and, and just kind of level uh, um, set. You know, we support Paris, um, you know, and the global net zero. And, you know, every participant's going to come at it with, with, in a slightly different way. We think the best role for Chevron is a leadership role in two things. Uh, one is to lower the carbon intensity of oil and gas. Um, because there is a uh, there is a need for oil and gas in in many parts of the economy, and so having a strong business and uh, moving it to a lower carbon business is is a particular part of our agenda. And the second is to invest in low carbon solutions that cut across all the things that uh, we've talked about and really help them to scale because innovation without scale is sort of a curiosity and everything, but it's not really gonna help. Um, and so we really focus on kind of three action areas that we can work on now. And it's gonna take partnership uh, with a number of, of different parts of the economy. So it's, it's about lowering the intensity of our own operations and that's you know methane and CO2 and it's energy efficiency and it's it's uh, CCUS and it's all the things that we've been talking about. It's incorporating renewable um, renewables into our operations. And I think this is where you start to see that, that energy is really a system um, and there's a diversity of fuel sources. So whether it's on the transportation side and incorporating um, renewable feedstocks into our products. And we've been working in that area for quite a long time. We're, we're a West Coast based company. And so we, we've we worked with the low carbon fuel standards and so forth on, um, on the West Coast uh, in that area. Um, but also renewable power into our operations in the field. And we have, I think, some really good examples of that in both California, but also in, in West Texas. And lastly, is we invest in the in the areas where, as Julio says, we don't have the technology today to do what we need to do, and it's going to take the innovators, it's the investors, it's it's the incumbent companies, the corporates, um, it's going to take the government, it's going to take academia, all working together. Um, we've got over two decades worth of experience in in working in that space, and um, you know, have made some really good progress. And we see pickup in the carbon removal space. Uh, we see pickup in hydrogen. So as, as Steve says, you know, hopefully it'll take, it take hold this time in terms of being able to see the breakthroughs and then work to scale it because that's what we need. Thank you, Barbara. Um, one, one of the areas where we've focused a lot of our attention discussing opportunities uh, and pathways towards a, a net zero future is in uh, the European Union with the realization of their green deal for uh, for Europe as part of their recovery from COVID-19, as well as thinking of the, the longer term of the, uh, the EU's energy and uh, emissions footprint. Um, it, it's clear that CO2 removal has to play a, a prominent role in the realization of that very aggressive policy target. Um, Julio, you and I, in preparation of this uh, session, had a good uh, uh, exchange of ideas about what's going on in Europe right now. I was wondering if you might say a little bit for the audience about what kind of project activity and the links to some of the regulatory measures that have been put in place that, uh, that we're seeing in the EU. Right, so uh, just last week, the EU as a whole voted for a 60% reduction target by 2030. That's really aggressive. That is just hard to reach. And one of the things we're seeing in response to that is commitments from the EU uh, for things like CO2 infrastructure at the Port of Rotterdam, uh, the Northern Lights Project from Norway, uh, and most notably recently in the United Kingdom. I don't see Prince Charles and Boris Johnson agreeing on much, but they're both saying that we need hydrogen, we need CCS, we need CO2 removal, as well as things like offshore wind, as well as things like efficiency. And uh, their six point plan, I think details a lot of this. They have begun to create research programs like the one that Steve manages in terms of 
direct air capture deployment and these sorts of things. It's being driven a little bit by the European trading scheme, by the ETS, but increasingly we're saying uh, things like the national commitments driving the specific uh, investments and outcomes. But we're starting to see all of these things come together and uh, it's being driven by a mixture of things, mostly by these commitments at the national level under the Paris Agreement, but to some extent by shareholder votes, by some extent by popular opinion, to some extent by political pressure, uh, and uh, uh, these things are, are coming on fast and furious. Thank you. It, um, it certainly does appear as though there's a mounting wave of, uh, of pressure for more and more solutions when it comes to achieving that balance and realizing um, some accord between sources of greenhouse gases or CO2 and removals. And it does also appear as though we're entering a period where um, certain types of temperature outcomes may or may not be realistic if we're unable to uh, begin to inflect global emissions trajectories. I think this is particularly pertinent thinking about how we recover from Corona uh, virus 19. And more and more of our clients have been asking about direct air capture. Um, and are, are we ready really for that technology at scale, Steve? I know you're, you're fostering that and Julio, um, you just highlighted the importance of that in European context, but if there's a merit order for CO2 removal technologies, do we need to skip to the end game now and get uh, direct air capture front and center, or do we need um, a broad base of different types of applications? And that's an open well, question to the panel. Steve, maybe you could say something because you have the leading attack program. <laughs> Yeah, I, um, I'll leave it to others to make predictions and um, uh, forecast prognostications and so forth. But I, I think that the direct air capture might, at, at least at this point in its evolution, might be more of a niche opportunity. Uh, and the reason I say that is that the cost is still quite high. It's, you see numbers of... Uh, I don't see any numbers less than $100 a ton and some numbers that are considerably higher than that. And I think that widespread of, of different costs per ton really depends on the size of it and where it's going to be located. But potentially the niche is that in this country, in the United States, we are having an incredibly difficult time building pipelines, pipelines for anything. Uh, and so uh, a mo the model several years ago was that you would – put CCUS on a coal-fired unit or now on a natural gas-fired unit or maybe an industrial facility in an ethanol plant or a hydrogen production plant, and you would pipe that CO2 maybe to a, uh, an oil field for enhanced oil recovery. But getting that, that pipeline, that infrastructure built, I think is, is, is problematic at this point. So is there an opportunity to locate the DAC units, the direct air capture units, uh, adjacent to or on top of the oil field? And so there may be a niche there. I can tell you that um, we are continuing to focus on reducing the cost of direct air capture. Can we get it down to the, the $30 uh, capture cost that we're looking at for large scale carbon capture units? I'm not sure. Uh, I, I have my doubts about that, but if we can, I, I know we can get the cost down and if we can, then I, I think the the aperture of opportunities for DAC uh, begins to open up. Um, but that's not to say that we skip over these point source emissions that we need to deal with, uh, because I think we still need to, to deal with those. I, I, for one, am not of the uh, view or uh, the opinion that we're going to be able to go 100% renewables across the energy space in the next decade. I think that's a lot of hand-waving. People don't really understand the enormity of the challenge. Uh, so I think it is going to take time. And even, even if we were able to do this in the United States in a decade, uh, the rest of the world won't. And so then you get into a lot of issues such as our cost of energy versus other parts of the world and whether or not if we reduce our emissions, does that move the needle much in terms of global CO2 emissions. So um, I think, again, it's a, it's a suite of technologies. Um, and I'll say it again, it's probably too early in the process uh, to uh, 
determine which are winners and which are not. So again, we will continue uh, as long as I'm in this job um, across the whole suite of technologies and commercializing them as fast as we possibly can. Yeah, I wanted to just echo, see that per perfect. It, there's, um, you know, there's a wide swath of technologies that need to be developed for this, uh, for achieving net zero, for succeeding in the energy transition. Um, the easiest CO2 to deal with is in process streams, um, point source, the hard, the more dilute, the harder it gets. Um, and, but we've got to, we've got to place multiple, you know, do multiple actions. And I, and I think understanding when to scale, um, is important. Um, and also the, the intersection of this with policy, with infrastructure needs and commercial frameworks. And, you know, I think we're going to be at multiple time horizons in these various technology uh, uh, pathways, um, and they're all going to be needed. So I agree with a lot of what Steve and Barbara said, and I know that I believe with a lot of their points. There's a few places where I draw some pretty sharp differences, though. One of them is, is about the loading order around these things. I want to be super clear about this. It's going to be cheaper to do capture at a point source. We all know that. That's just chemical engineering. And we need to get along with that as quickly as possible. But right now, to hit these aggressive targets of one and a half degrees or two degrees, you cannot solve the math without the tonnage that you get from CO2 removal. And the National Academies have concluded that about 50% of that tonnage is going to be in direct air capture. Second thing is on cost. We know the recipe for cost reduction. We've done that as a nation for a long time. You put money into R&D and innovation like Steve's program and Barb's program do. You get deployment going. You have market-aligned policies. And the costs come down. And we don't need it, direct air capture, to be 30 bucks a ton. That's kind of silly. We're going to see conventional CO2 capture at that level for sure. But for, if direct air capture gets to $300 a ton, the cost of global abatement drops $3 trillion. Because that's the part that you can't fix with other stuff. And if you get the cost down to 150 bucks a ton, you save $5 trillion worldwide, which seems like a useful thing. Um, and I know this is a topic which is near and dear to the Department of Energy's heart. The United States innovates on that first. We have an export market. We are globally competitive, and that's true not just for conventional capture technology, whether it's on hydrogen or whether it's on steel mills or whether it's on power plants, but the same thing is true for direct air capture. There is no better place to do direct air capture than the United States. Thank you, Julio. Well, it seems to me I, that that raises a, a, a couple of different thoughts. Um, the first is that you know the traditional narrative is that CO2 removal is very expensive compared to other mitigation opportunities. Certainly, this has played into the, um, the rapid buildout of uh, renewable uh, electricity generation over the course of, say, the last 15 years, that um, it's offered a better price point uh, per ton of CO2 removed. And yet, yeah, that's it, not it, true. It feel like there's that's not true. You, you, you don't support that assertion. So it, it, they are, there are a bunch of options that are cheaper today, but let's start with policies today. The subsidy that we give to ethanol is $400 a ton. That is already more expensive than direct air capture. Okay. The, the, what we're paying for electric vehicles in subsidies in the state of California and Washington is north of $1,000 a ton. We are already paying this extreme amount of money to support stuff that is not commercial today. We just don't tend to measure those things in dollars per ton. And the classic case here is sustainable aviation fuels. Today, on a dollar per ton basis, sustainable aviation fuels are between $400 and $1,200 a ton of avoided emissions. That's bonkers. Direct air capture is already cheaper than that. <laughs> like we, like we, like, and, and so the, the, we need actually a standard metric to do this work. We need to measure things on a levelized cost of carbon abated. And coincidentally, we're releasing a report on that on Monday. Things like direct air capture and carbon tax are the only things that are measured in dollars per ton. Solar panels in California are cheap. Utility scale solar cost of abatement is like 30 bucks a ton. You should totally do that. That's great. A bunch of efficiency measures yield money. They actually create savings. 
we should definitely do that. But rooftop solar panels in New Jersey are about $500 a ton. That is not cheaper than direct air capture. It's certainly not cheaper than conventional carbon capture. So it seems like we need a different language. We need a different language to capture the benefits. Steve, are you, are you seeing that in your discussions with colleagues within the US government as well as internationally, the, maybe the opportunity to, to really capture or standardize the, uh, the mitigation opportunity in a way which would perhaps give uh, CO2 removal a, perhaps a slightly more level playing field to, to speak from? No, I, I agree with Julio on this, and oftentimes Julio and I actually agree, which is a good thing. Uh, but um, I don't think that the, the, the conversation has gone that, that far yet. And, and so I just want to glom on a little bit uh, here to what, what Julio was talking about. You know, I've always been bothered by this, uh, this marginal cost of renewable energy. Uh, you know, and you hear it's two, two cents or maybe it's a penny uh, a kilowatt hour, <clears throat> but in fact it's not. And, and we only need to look to um, California to see what happens when you think you've got a cost coming in at two cents or one cent, because that's not the total cost of that renewable energy. You need backup natural gas combined cycle, for example, but that cost doesn't get rolled in to the cost for the renewable energy. You need, if you've got a wind farm or a solar farm and you need to uh, wield the power into where the demand center is, the cost of that um, that transmission line doesn't get doesn't get added into the cost, and so to Julio's point, except perhaps a little bit broader discussion, we're not measuring the true cost of any of this yet. Uh, we are looking at it sort of in isolation. I think eventually we will get to the point where we are measuring the true cost of it, uh, but we're not there yet. Um, but I have confidence we'll get there and. Uh, People will start, again, once industry picks this up in a meaningful way and starts commercializing it, they are the best to look at the various costs, capital cost, fixed and variable O&M cost, uh, run their numbers and make the best informed financial decisions. And uh, we'll get there, but uh, we're not there yet. So we invested in a direct air capture company um public knowledge um and you know it, it's at the pilot stage and it's ready to do the first plant and i agree with with both julio and steve you know the first plant um you get a lot of learnings it's going to be high cost and those costs are going to come down as we get the second plant third plant fourth plant and you know we were interested in a number of things relative to how do you how do you deal with the energy demands on capturing the CO2 at, from a, you know, in a direct air capture sense. What do you do with the CO2? Um, how does renewable energy help you in that? So there were a number of things that I think are good learnings, not just for that company and its progress, but in this space in total. And we need more ideas and more innovators working in this. And then those of us whose job it is to support those innovators um, need to be out there helping them um, both from a financial standpoint, but I think importantly from you know our experience in scale and engineering and, and so forth, because that's really where at, at a certain point they're going to need a lot of help. Very good, very good. Well, I was just going to summarize because I'm, I'm afraid we're uh, essentially out of time for uh, today's conversation, but if I was to... Wait to... a minute, we just got started. Uh, well, I, I suppose, are there final points that each of the, the panelists would like to make? I know we're all having a fantastic time here. So if, if, there's, if there's something to really unlock the value of CO2 removal that you think is lacking from the discussion today, please, so please put it forward. I, I want to say just a couple of quick things, sort of echoing some of Steve's comments. To Steve's point, actually, I think we agree far more frequently than not, actually, and, and that's true across the board. First of all, we we can't we have to get past this false dichotomy of its renewables or carbon capture or its point source capture versus direct air capture. Like we know we need all the parts to build the motorcycle, so we have to make all the parts. That's not really negotiable. Like we know we have to do all of these things. There's a question of emphasis, but it's not really a question of what the portfolio looks like, and there's not really a question of the timing. The timing is we start on this ten years ago. <laughs> um, second of all. 
we just uh, the other along those lines, we just need to do more. And industry in particular needs to do more. There has to be more investment in infrastructure. There has to be more investment in pilots. There has to be more investment in technology. And it should be, I think, jointly taken on by companies in the republic. You know, we just we need to have public private partnerships to get large scale demonstrations up, to build pipelines, to get all this stuff done. And uh, we are definitely going to go farther and faster if we're all working together. I was just going to say um, consistent, collaborative effort towards the problem. I agree. And, and I think um, from the DOE's perspective, um, within the, the DOE house, if you will, I, I think there is a lot of collaboration between the various offices, fossil energy office, renewables office, uh, nuclear energy, our office of electricity, um, and maybe just a, a little bit of a commercial or a little bit of a plug here. Uh, we just, uh, the Fossil Energy Office uh, just issued a request for information on enhanced weathering research because we've been talking about carbon capture, but there are also opportunities to um, expand the CO2 capture through this weatherization. And so here's my uh, request for anybody that's listening to this. Please take a look at our RFI. We're very interested in what can be done um, in, in the nexus between this advanced uh, weatherization, um, crop yields, uh, both calcium and magnesium, uh, and how we can do carbon uptake with that, and also the opportunities to utilize that material um, uh, for uh, water quality. So um, please take an opportunity to look at the RFI and give us your comments. We cannot do what we do without input from industry and from academia and from the public at large. So again, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to, to spend time with you today. Well, thank you, Steve. Uh, Barbara, thank you. And Julio, thank you. It's been a, a great conversation. Um, I hope the uh, participants listening in have enjoyed this as much as I have. It's clear that you don't get to net zero without CO2 removal, that we have a, a wide variety of technologies available uh, to further that cause, uh, and that uh, the costs and opportunities are headed in some very interesting directions. Costs are coming down and more and more opportunities are presenting themselves. And I think that that's a very encouraging note to, to end today's uh, conversation upon. Thanks again for listening. Bye for now.